you will find devil's advocates for Sonic 2006. You will find honest fans of Unleashed, even Forces, who at worst wish the games just had more time in the oven. You may even find someone who finished Sonic Blast, but good luck finding anyone willing to go to bat for Sonic Freeriders, the other worst Sonic game. This video is sponsored by viewers like you. Thanks to all my patrons. Be warned that this video may contain flashing lights. Please proceed with caution if you are photosensitive. Part 1. The fastest creature on the ground! <laughs> I call Freeriders the other worst Sonic game because it's not the go-to choice like 06 or Rise of Lyric. Despite his speed, Sonic's not as known for his racing games as he is action platformers. And part of that is a spotty history with racing. The Sonic Drifts tried to compete with Super Mario Kart, but were too exceedingly bland to be more than bad pole position. Sonic R was a ripe slice of jank, but I and many other people still played the hell out of it, and it has an active speedrunning community to this day. It's not just Sonic in a nutshell. The All-Stars racing games are actually solid Mario Kart clones loaded full of Sega fan service, and eventually only Sonic fan service, and there were also the two Sonic Rivals games. I don't know anything about them, but floating around in the middle of all these is the Sonic Riders trilogy. Hoverboard racers with unique characters, fully written and voiced story modes, and their own levels of jank. But like Sonic R, there was enough there that they also earned a fan base. But most people forgot about the third game, Free Riders, like the Kinect it was made to be played with. And that's the key as to why this is such a unique disaster for Sonic. Whatever you could say about 06 or Rise of Lyric, they only hurt your soul. Honestly, when I decided I was going to play and review Freeriders, I was under the assumption that it amounted to gaming peripheral shovelware, something with the care and passion of carnival games. Part of that is I've never seen anyone review it beyond I literally can't play it, but also because I just never actually played any of the Riders games. I was at that age where he just had to tell me, if Sonic ran on foot, he'd win, and I wouldn't buy a game. But I wanted to go into Freeriders with as much context as possible. So first thing I did was I played through the GameCube version of Riders, and the Wii version of Zero Gravity. Actually, I played both on Dolphin, but you didn't hear that from me. The first Riders feels like an experiment that almost worked. Take Sonic and friends, plop them in a techno skate punk hoverboard race, add some birds and see what sticks. You fly around on extreme gears that run on air, through creatively twisty race tracks that take you up and down and all around. You gather rings to level up your stats and your air meter, do spin and roll tricks off of ramps to refill that air, or in scripted sequences, do a Mario party. You have several ways to gain speed. You can get a head start by moving at the starting line, as long as you time it right. You can sacrifice some of your air for a quick boost which doubles as an attack if anyone gets close. If you hold a drift long enough, you'll do a dash, but drifting also costs air. One of the game's cooler mechanics is racers ahead of you can leave a trail of turbulence that you can then ride like a halfpipe regardless of your air meter. At certain points, you can jump up out of the turbulence and do a spin trick that will both speed you up and refill some of your meter, and still, that incessant omo chow will say, you suck, Tails. <laughs> A less impactful but still important mechanic is the character types. Speed, flight, or power, a la Sonic Heroes. This has some effect on their stats, but it mostly affects what alternate routes you can take. Speed types can grind on specially marked rails if you remember to press A and don't panic and press it twice because it stores the input. Flight types can take off from specific yellow ramps, letting them access a trail of boost rings. And power types can smash through certain walls and obstacles. Using these routes also recovers air. There are also hidden shortcuts connected to the jump ramps that anyone can use, as long as you charge your jump up enough before you hit the ramp. And by god, you need to use both these and the class routes to win most races. Riders is surprisingly difficult, and remembering all of these mechanics is going to be key to beating, at minimum, the story mode. The problem with the game is that hoverboards are not the tightest of vehicles, and while you can unlock boards with better stats, they cost a crazy amount of rings, and the max amount of rings you can get each race is 100, assuming you can hold on to them. Just do Splash Canyon on Free Races Storm and take this power tunnel, you'll win every time. However, in the story mode, you cannot change boards, and you only play specific characters depending on the level. So if you can't get a handle on each of their quirks, you will be very frustrated playing through the story, where you're required to get first place every single time. Most levels have bottomless pits, and you need to have drifting down pat to avoid some of them. Unfortunately, turbulence can also be used against you, as it essentially locks you into a path, regardless of anything else you want to do, like, say, drift. How about this ice factory level, where you can be affected by ice physics? 
on a board that doesn't touch the ground. Later levels can be nightmares. One slip up will cost you your entire race, no matter where or when it happens. There's one specific turn in Babylon Garden that I cannot make without completely slowing down, something I never have to do in any other levels because the drift's boost is designed to redirect you. It's just too tight a turn for the drift to work. And I can only make this turn if I am in first place with a huge lead on everyone else, because if I'm not, the character in front of me lays down a windpipe, which locks me into a path that sends me careening into the abyss. I had to retry pretty much every level several times to learn them, an excruciating amount by the time of Babylon Garden especially, but it didn't even matter how well I knew a level when I was done, because they all got remixed in the Babylon story. Oh yeah, they try for a bit of Sonic Adventure 2 nostalgia by having you play two halves of the same story. You beat the game once with Sonic and friends, and then you play as the new antagonists, a trio of air pirates called the Babylon Rogues, and get their side of the story. This game did come out in 2006, it is one of Sonic's better games from that year, but the story shares one particular quirk with Sonic 06, that you see none of it when you play Sonic. The hero's half is very white bread. We gotta win the Grand Prix! What's Eggman up to? What mean new rivals? Amy! And then a city floats out of the desert and you wonder, what the hell is that for? You then unlock the Babylon story, and it's actually a story. The rogues, descendants of the people of ancient Babylon, get a surprise visit from Dr. Eggman. He strikes a deal with them. He'll help them find their people's lost civilization in exchange for them stealing the Chaos Emeralds and defeating Sonic. They then plot behind the scenes and bicker in alternate versions of previous cutscenes where you see what they're really up to, until eventually Babylon returns and then a genie shows up as a piss easy boss fight, they get a carpet, and the game ends. The story stinks, but in a pretty bland way. It is some of the very worst voice acting in the franchise, but unlike Adventure 2 or 06, it's more irritating than funny. You better make sure you're ready when we meet face to face! <laughs> Ultimately, Sonic Riders is a Sonic game. It's a finicky mess, but a mess with some style. And if you get a handle on its quirks, you can have some fun with it. I have trouble recommending it to anyone. The learning curve is very high, and no matter how good I got at the game, I never felt cool doing any of this. You should feel cool pulling some of this off, but it's such a clunky, erratic experience that I had to work way too hard to get a handle on that I was just glad to be done with it. An optional tutorial mode wouldn't go amiss, something to actually teach you those obscure mechanics and how to use them. Not a shitty little video buried in the extras that you will almost certainly never see and doesn't tell you nearly enough. The game hadn't arrived in the mail yet, I couldn't read the manual. If difficult games are your jam, you might get into it, but I don't blame you if you finish the hero's story and you decide you've had enough. If I were to give it a numerical rating, I wouldn't tell you. Its sequel, on the other hand... <laughs> It's like Tails. It makes me smile. Zero Gravity is what you want out of a sequel. Smooth out some of the clunky mechanics, add in features that enhance the experience, tell a more compelling story, and let you play as Shadow riding a broomstick. The game changes up quite a bit. If you just hop into a race not knowing what's new, you're gonna be just as frustrated as last time. But here's the key to enjoying this game. The optional tutorial mode! At last, the game tells you what you fucking do to win. And it goes into detail on all the core mechanics and even stuff you may not often use. Please do all of it before you play the full game. But here's the gist. Air is out. Gravity is in. All the stuff you did before of collecting rings, doing tricks off ramps, taking class-specific side paths, those are now in service of your gravity meter, which does not tick down in normal gameplay. You're no longer spending resources just to ride your board. Instead, you use gravity to do this. You have two major new mechanics. First, your standard drift is now a sudden stop that lifts you into the air, lets you turn in whatever direction you want to move, even vertically, and then blasts you in that direction. You can even use it over pits to save you if you're quick about it. The game expects it of you in some later levels. It's like the drifting speed boost you got in the first game taken to an extreme that is so ridiculous it's wonderful, and you can even use it to access some sideways paths. Keep in mind if you're playing with a GameCube controller and coming directly from the first riders, the drift has replaced the dash and attack on B, and that tripped me up a lot earlier. On. Second new move is this. This is the gravity dive. This takes the place of drift on your R trigger, which also tripped me up a lot. But then I learned that it breaks every race wide open. When you're on a long straightaway, you hold down R, your character obliterates everything around them, and then you can skate along floating objects for massive speed boosts. And every time you do one of your gravity skills, the music cuts out and picks back up at a different point in the song. It's one of my favorite things I've ever done in a Sonic game. 
Some other changes worth noting, you no longer hold down the jump button before a ramp, and you no longer spin around in the air to do tricks. Instead, depending on how far up the ramp you go before you press jump, you'll do better tricks and get more height. You might call that a needless simplification, but I'm not convinced the original ramp system worked all the time anyway, so I'm fine with it. The game has enough going on around it that I don't miss it. There are also the in-race upgrades you get from collecting rings. In Riders, you increase your stats and air meter at certain milestones, but losing rings from falling into a pit or getting hit would also also lose your upgrades. However, no matter what, your character would always be able to access their class-specific routes. Zero Gravity system is a little more involved, and the game draws better attention to what you're actually doing. Now, when you collect enough rings for an upgrade, you have to press a button to spend those rings to change gears. Gear the first gear is a max speed increase. The second gear modifies your vehicle so that you can access the grind, flight, power, etc. shortcuts, since those powers are now tied to your board rather than your character. And the third gear increases your max gravity meter. Later unlockable boards may have different gears entirely and may not allow you to take shortcuts. Those upgrades are now with you the entire race, no matter how badly you do, and not being able to grind rails or smash through obstacles from the get-go is not as much of a downgrade as it sounds. If you're good about collecting rings, you'll be in second gear before the second lap, no problem. You might say all of these changes just make zero gravity easy, maybe even too easy, but this gameplay loop is actually fun and satisfying in a way that the first Riders just isn't. With Riders, if I messed up at any point, I had to restart the entire race because I had no way of recovering. One mistake was catastrophic, and it was only frustrating and tedious for me. In Zero Gravity, I did have to restart some races once or twice before I came in first, but as the game went on and I got a handle on its mechanics, I didn't feel like I needed to restart anymore. If I fell behind, I knew I'd have opportunities to recover. I felt comfortable living with my mistakes and going the whole race anyway. Yes, the gravity dive is a bit of a cheese, but it feels so good to do in a way the first riders never touched. It actually feels as cool as it looks. Shockingly, the story is way better too. Sonic and friends are no longer suckered into Eggman's most obvious plot yet, but instead are swept up in a techno mystery. A meteor shower drops strange blocky rings around the world, which cause robots owned by the security company Meteotech to go berserk and hunt the rings down. Sonic and friends get caught up in this due to Tails finding one of those rings the previous night, and it turns out they do some crazy shit. Luckily, all the robots want to do is race for some reason, and the team is already decked out for it despite there not being a Grand Prix. Instead, the races are just part of the story, usually framed as a chase, either you escaping the Meteotech robots or you trying to catch one of them. It's a very silly way to frame three lap races. One level has you escape ruins by essentially driving in a circle, but it's a fun twist on the idea of a racing game, and it makes Sonic's involvement actually feel consequential this time. Eventually, the Babylon rogues return, and we learn that the rings are Arcs of the Cosmos, more artifacts from ancient Babylon. We then learn Eggman is the owner of Meteotech, but even he isn't sure why his robots are after the Arcs. He still plans to invade with them, so everyone stops him, the Babylon Garden returns out of nowhere, and Sonic just gives Jet all the Arcs because he's chill like that, I guess. Once again, completing the hero story unlocks the Babylon story, which oddly includes an Amy level in the middle of it. We also learn a strange Babylonian story of a lightless black that assaulted the Divine Wings, a cryptic pile of words that won't mean anything until the end of the game. But we don't learn too much new until we catch up to the ending of the hero story. Tails figures out that Sonic should not have given Jet all the arcs, because if all five return to the Babylon Garden together, they will cause the lightless black. I.e., they'll make a black hole. And then they make a black hole, and everything is engulfed in a storm of death, and everyone just dives into it to stop it. For one cutscene, this game becomes metal as hell. Like the first game, the one boss is also pretty abrupt, not very clearly explained, and not very hard. But it is definitely way more fun and involved to fight. You're actually racing the other characters to be the first one to hit it, and you complete laps by doing damage. I feel like I missed something, spoiler alert, as pointless as it is. They just drop in the resolution that the ancient Babylonians were aliens. I did not gather that in the story up to that point, maybe that was my bad. But aside from that, the story is actually halfway interesting. Check out my boy Knuckles being able to read. The voice acting's better too. It's not leaps and bounds, but 2008 was very much the year Jason Griffith finally settled into his roles. And then he was fired. Ultimately, Zero Gravity was some of the most fun I've had with Sonic in general in a long time. I understand that's because I played it with this on an emulator and not with a Wii Remote. Apparently I dodged a bullet. Okay, fine, give me a minute. Yeah, don't do that. I didn't know how good I had it, people. 
Playing with the remote isn't hellish. I beat the story mode with it and didn't have to restart too many races, but the motion controls are so much looser and less precise. Your tricks, gravity actions, and such are responsive since they're all button presses. It's entirely turning and moving around in a 3D space that's unreliable. Knuckles, you're on a bike. How are you this lumpy? It's probably closer to what riding an extreme gear would be like in real life, thinking about it, but I greatly prefer using a standard controller, and I recommend you do too if you play this. But otherwise, I like Zero Gravity a lot. The story mode is very short, you can beat it in a few hours at most, but with the right control setup, and as long as you play through the tutorial first, the game is a lot of fun, and considering the critical indifference it got, probably a hidden gem in the franchise. If I were to give it a numerical rating, you'll never know. Get over your obsession with numbers, they mean nothing. And so, that is my experience with Sonic Riders going into the third game. The first was clunky and frustrating, but it almost worked. I wouldn't say I like it, but I do appreciate it, and I can't see how someone could get into it. The second I liked a lot. For me, it improved on the original in pretty much every way. I still don't care about the Babylon Rogues, but at least they're more interesting than I thought they'd be. So if this next Riders game can continue that upward trajectory, improve on that solid foundation even more, we could have a serious winner on our hands. This is Sonic Team. They don't do that. I'm getting ready to play and film Free Riders. I'm recording both myself against a green screen and the game together to give the full experience. But I don't want to start this review by talking about the gameplay. That is how I review the last two games. It's the most important part of a racing game. But I want this review to be hopefully a fresh take on Free Riders. So I want to start by talking about everything else, because I've never heard anyone talk about anything else. Also a little sneak peek into a future project. I don't have any good speakers for this, and I don't want to wear my big headphones, so I'm listening to the game on a pair of Raycons. I'm planning to do a big video where I try out and review a bunch of those big YouTube sponsors, because you're not going to get an honest, thorough review from the people they sponsor. If you want to see that, please support my Patreon to fund the project. I'll have more details on it later. Like I said at the start of the video, I went into this project under the assumption that Freeriders amounted to shovelware, that Sonic Team half-assed an entry in a subseries no one cared that much about, so that the Kinect could have an exclusive. Having played the first two writers and learned that they had a surprising amount of care and good ideas put into them, I hoped that I was wrong. Then I started the tutorial. Turn your whole to break, and that's all you really need to know. They're just straight up reusing this music from the first game. Glorious. Okay, but that's just one minor red flag. Some Sonic games reuse jingles, it's not a big deal. Then I started the story mode. <laughs> Greetings, world! Another Grand Prix is set to begin! Your host, as always, is Doc. Uh, that's right, King Doc of uh, uh, Toric Mania! You know what, that alone made me want to play. I'm not gonna lie. That's a pretty good intro for Eggman's stupid plan this time around. Kind of a cheap looking intro, just being static renders of him and Omo Chow. But it's probably just the announcement video played over TVs or on a big screen over the race, something like that. That's fine. Let's get into the story proper. Ladies and gentlemen, the World Grand Prix is finally set to begin! Oh, that's every cutscene. How half did they ask this? It's one thing that we're looking at deliberately obscured slideshows, but they might as well not even be here for what they amount to. It's Extreme Gear Grand Prix time again, and characters showed up. Nothing to do with Ancient Babylon, nothing motivating anyone beyond win the race or win the prize money. The writing in general isn't awful, it's just a dull string of conversations and one-liners that gesture at being funny, but don't even succeed at being charming. The Sonic Fan Wiki claims this is the first game written by Ken Pontak and Warren Graff, the guys who wrote Sonic Colors' root canal of a script, but I couldn't find any solid evidence of that. If they did write it, they weren't in the credits. It does read like the games they wrote, though. Freeriders has that same problem of potentially funny bits that just forget to stop when it's not outright disdainful for the intelligence of its audience. There are funny ideas here. Vector has joined Amy and Cream's team because he's broke-ass, and if they win, he can pay his bills and buy food. Shadow and Rouge don't have Omega with them, but their team still needs a third member to qualify, so they just pull a random robot into their team who later overheats from stress. And of course, King Doc, like we saw, even though he's in two cutscenes before he drops his disguise at the end. 
but that's kind of it. At the time of writing this part of the script, I finished recording my playthrough only two days ago, and I already don't remember a single line of dialogue. The whole story just blends together into a droning puppet show on the world's bluest CRT. They could have just skipped the story altogether and only had the races, and the game wouldn't have been any worse. I will give credit to the new voice cast, replacing the four kids' voice actors. They do all right in their first jobs as these characters. Roger Craig Smith is Sonic, Kate Higgins in her brief run as Tails, Travis Willingham as Knuckles, etc. Most everyone seemed to fit from the get-go. Roger and Kate would get a much worse script in Sonic Colors that would present their voice acting in a much worse light, but I think it's clear by now that wasn't their fault. On that note, Cindy Robinson as Amy does come across as miscast with her much older sounding voice. Part of the problem is that every character has been juiced of all dimension to their personality, and Amy's barely had any since Sonic Heroes. It's just for Cindy, the lower timbre mixed with that higher, brattier affectation makes her slip into Minnie Mouse. We've been running as fast as we can since we got here, man! This is all because you were dragging your tail, Vector! Now you'd better talk us out! Borderline racist, Amy! Her voice would fit a lot better in later games, and especially in the Sonic Boom franchise where Amy is played as an older and wiser character. Even Kirk Thornton as Shadow, who I generally don't like in that role, does all right here. He doesn't do as much of that <sighs> that he'd do a lot more in later appearances. He would be much worse in Sonic Boom. Full Sonic Boom franchise retrospective, working on it now, support my Patreon anyway. The only voice I outright don't like is Michael Yurchak's take on Jet. Regardless of why we're here, this Grand Prix is ours, Sonic the Hedgehog. Oh my god. His voice. But I doubt that's Mike's fault. Part of Jet's character has always been his keening little bitch voice. <laughs> Aside from playing out the story on a Viewmaster, the game looks nice. They took advantage of the 360's graphical power, though not as well as Unleashed. Also, YouTube compression will turn it into dog shit, but nothing I can do about that. The music is a mixed bag. I haven't talked much about the music in the writer's games, because it's largely interchangeable extreme sports, techno, and electronica. They do have some nice melodies woven in there, but when you hear those tracks, your first thought is, yep, that's mid-2000s X Games music. The theme songs are pretty bad too, Crush 40 they are not. It's the same deal here, with the half of the soundtrack composed by Tomonori Sawada bordering on indistinguishable from the music in the first writers. But then things take an interesting turn in Team Babylon's story. <laughs> what is this music? What is this music? <laughs> I can't decide if I love it or hate it, fuck you. The rest of the music, composed by Koji Sakurai, is a lot more playful and memorable. It's more akin to Hideki Naganuma's soundtrack for Sonic Rush, though not as whimsical and hyperactive. The theme song Free, sung by Chris Madden, is also a lot better. I like the melody and Chris's harmonized vocals in the chorus. And it actually was written by Crush 40. Of course, they don't perform the version in the game, but they did record their own version for the OST. Don't listen to their version. Call right now for Johnny's voice and buy a shirt. Well, my assumption that Sonic Team just shat this one out is a little more accurate than I'd hoped. I still want to give the game a chance, though. I suspect its reputation is closely tied to the reputation of the Kinect itself, that it was just a cynical reach for the Wii's audience that Microsoft banked way too hard on. But those who've sat down with the Kinect stood up with the Kinect, have noted that the technology was there. The Kinect was responsive and reliable as long as the game knew how to use it. And if there's anything Sonic Team knows how to do, it's not. Yeah! God, my knee hurts. Let's at least be nice and start with the things I liked. Compared to the first two games, there's more variety in the story mode. The first two had you play Team Hero, Team Babylon, and then race the final boss. But in this game, the roster also includes Team Dark and Team Rose, albeit with a confusing character replacement in each. There's really no reason Omega and Big the Cat couldn't be in here, but I'll explain why they did that later. So who's the last member of Team Dark? Uh-oh, the little deer's run off again. There he is. Much of the story mode is actually small challenges. Collecting 100 rings, using character abilities a certain amount of times, earning enough points from doing tricks off of ramps. These aren't any easier to accomplish than the races, and believe me, it'll be no fault of your own. But I do appreciate that you're doing a lot more in the story mode than just getting first place. 
Some of the gameplay ideas are actually fun in execution, not just in concept. Racing on a cycle is by far the most reliable. You just hold your hands up and you don't have to worry about slipping a disc. Some of the weapons and power-ups are finicky to use, but bowling over your opponents with a giant ball is pretty funny. Don't hit your own ball, Sonic! <laughs> And blasting ahead of everyone on a shaken can of soda is hilarious. Not that you'll ever get that power-up. That's it. Things I don't like. Playing the game. If you remember my crack about playing with the Wii Remote, probably feeling more accurate to riding a hoverboard, that's also pretty true to using the Kinect and Free Riders, in that it's terribly loose, not fun, and I'd rather use a normal controller. The difference being, I never whacked my Wii Remote against my knee. Playing this game is physically strenuous. I already started feeling my left knee aching within the hero story, and I jog and do squats. It's not the turning. Sonic, you fucker. It is loose and finicky and will cost you plenty of races, but being able to turn isn't really how you win. What is, like the previous games, is leveling up with rings, using shortcuts and your character's unique paths, and making smart use of your kick boost to keep ahead of the competition. This would be much easier if the game knew what I was doing. Jumping, boosting, leaning forward to speed up. Unless you're doing that action so hard you pull something, the game can recognize it about 50% of the time. And the game has just enough delay between you miming the action and your character doing it to make every race a coin flip. Here's me trying to adjust my altitude while flying. Take it. Take it. Pause. I'm gonna figure this fucking thing out. Even though the game doesn't want me to play as Rouge in a race. Here's me trying to use the kick boost. I race the caravan. Kick! God damn it, Amy! Here I get ready. Here's me trying to fucking jump. Why was that? Why did that not count? I even saw you crouch, Sonic. Why? Let's fly! Fucker! What position do you even think I'm in anymore? <laughs> Fuck you! Problem is, you're going to get worse in the game because you get tired and the game stops working! I did it? Oh, fuck you! Start. Pause. For the record, pause is the only voice command you'll really use, because it's the only one that actively does anything. The game recognizes what you're saying in the menus, and will move the menu around according to your commands. Game theory. Amy's a narcissist. Team Dark. But it won't actually select anything for you. You need to use your hand to do that. Next. Next. Next! <laughs> it's the most minor of questions the game makes me ask in a sea of confusion. I get the significance of trying out and taking advantage of new technology, and making something different that hasn't really been done before. It's gotta start somewhere. This game should not have been at the start. They should have delayed it, or not even started development until all possible issues with the Kinect were solved. Not once would my experience have been lessened by just using a controller. It would have irrefutably improved everything. To wit, I should point out that peculiar little red guy at the top of the screen. The one thing I do know is the little buddy there is not supposed to be Knuckles, he's supposed to be white. He's supposed to tell you if you're in a good spot for the camera. White means good, red means bad. Thing is, he almost seems irrelevant. The Kinect itself could see me and could register what I was doing, regardless of the fact that my feet weren't in shot. It just didn't do it sometimes. Pause. The only time the little guy said I was in the right place was when I left the room in the middle of Team Rose's story, then came back to the exact place I had been the entire time. Why is the little guy white for the first time? And guess what? The game was no more reliable than it had been before. I think the controls are just fucked. 
turn, Amy! Not helping matters is that your character's unique abilities, grinding, flight, and punching, are tied to what direction you're facing. The tutorial hypes this up as a feature of the game, because outside of story mode, you can customize your board to have multiple abilities, or just the same ability on both ends. In the story mode, once you're in a major race, your skill is locked to one specific stance, because your characters prefer regular or goofy foot like in skateboarding. I'm not goddamn ambidextrous. One of these positions is going to be more comfortable than the other. Probably the one I got used to doing in the four previous missions where the game let me use either stance, because spinning on a jump never worked, so I stopped trying. Remember, kids? Strats before playing Sonic Freeriders. If Freeriders has any direct comparison outside of playing Zero Gravity with the Wii Remote, it's to Sonic's other Wii spin-offs, Secret Rings and The Black Knight, a pair of cheap, clunky, but weirdly earnest and almost charming games built around motion controls, with slideshow cutscenes no less, but they put way more work into those. The storybook games were made to really take advantage of the remote's capabilities, proving once and for all that Sonic Team is not rare and does not know how to use Nintendo hardware to its fullest. Well, Sonic Team's not rare for Microsoft, either. Everything you've heard about Freerider's unplayability may be a hair overstated. It's not as bad as its reputation, but it's not anywhere playable enough to justify what it asks of you. It's not just frustrating, it's emotionally and physically draining. And you know what? I didn't finish it. I quit in the last story before I could reach the final race. Multiple unimpressive spoiler alerts, by the way. King Doc was Eggman all along. He used the races to record everyone's data so he could make an ultimate extreme gear. And I guess canonically now he was right, because my legs hurt so fucking much and my patience was gone. Pause. I quit. What did I miss out on? Well, Metal Sonic was actually in disguise as that Eggbot the whole time. There was a reason he was there instead of Omega. He should have replaced Vector. I'm still bitter about this. Metal Sonic fed Eggman bogus data and kept the real data for himself. So you have a real final race with him. Thank you, the real Sonic fan, for this footage. I think that proves enough. I must not be a real Sonic fan because I didn't finish this, so what do I care? I got everything I could possibly get out of this game, and it had nothing more to give me than the same pain and disappointment. And you might say, well, Michaela, just take a longer break and heal up. Wait a couple days and try again. You could finish this thing. Do it for YouTube. You can't legitimize this long dribbling video you made about a trilogy no one cares that much about if you just quit at the finish line. You gotta do it for YouTube. And to that I would say, and I cannot stress this enough, fuck YouTube. Fuck this platform and its algorithm, encouraging a culture of self-flagellation, humiliation, meaningless clout chasing, corporate hackery strangling creativity. I would be no more proud of this video if I could show you the final cutscene using my own footage. You would be no more satisfied with this video as a viewer in any way that matters to either of us. I am not your friend. I can live with your disappointment. Sonic Freeriders is a game I get nothing out of playing except literal physical pain. You wouldn't get anything out of me finishing it either. It's not worth it to either of us. Let it go. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter! Besides, if I didn't quit when I did, this wouldn't have happened. Pause. I quit. Replay. Game? Like I said at the start of the video, I was going to skip the first two games and go straight to Freeriders, but I decided to play through them for context. And in a way, I could have not bothered, because Freeriders is shit in ways independent of the others. It doesn't care about the first two games, I doubt it even respects them. But I'm glad I did play the first two, because they helped me achieve my goal of developing a fresh take on Freeriders and that I came around to appreciating the series, so it pisses me off more. Among the very least this franchise has to offer, it's down at the bottom with Sonic Boom Rise of Lyric in how, one, not fun it is to play, and two, unambitious it is in every way. It's not like Sonic 06, where you could see they wanted to go for gusto, but their efforts were destroyed by catastrophic acts of God. And it's not like Colors or Generations After, which were also pulled back in scope, but the devs put their focus on making the gameplay work. Theoretically, Rise of Lyric and Free Riders both suck on both counts. But Rise of Lyric fails, to paraphrase Todd in the Shadows, not in the presence of bad, but the absence of good. Free Riders is similar, but it leans more towards the bad. It is a slightly less soul crushing experience, but it is a knee crushing experience, so it's called a draw. And that was the Sonic Riders trilogy. What did I learn? <sighs> Nothing about Sonic in general I didn't already know. 
one in three of his games might be good, one in three might be shit. Go figure. I did gain an appreciation for a sub-series of his that I'd just written off as soon as it came out. Oh, Sonic, you let me win! You're such a gentleman! Are you crazy? I gave that race all I had! If you were on your feet, you would win! That was completely unfair, and it turned out I really enjoyed one of them. And I don't think I'm alone in that, because, as is so often proving to be the case, when you're disappointed in Sonic Team, look away. To the fans. A handful of fans are taking it upon themselves to remake or remaster the first two games, and I want to highlight a few of them here. Sonic Riders X, a fan game shown off at the 2021 Sonic Amateur Games Expo. It's a freshened up remake of the original and Zero Gravity made on Unity, with some creative liberties taken by the development team Gigas and Beats. It only has a very small, very incomplete demo right now. You can only do a solo time attack, and there are some frame hitching and geometry issues I ran into. But hot damn, it feels so good to control. Just the act of turning normally feels so much more smooth, responsive, and satisfying than it did in the first game. I'm sure part of that is the much higher frame rate, but in general, the originals never felt totally responsive or reliable, where you had to rely on drifting because turning felt so loose. Zero Gravity was just the best they had managed with that control scheme. But even for a demo with a lot of work left in its future, what the hell am I hitting here? Riders X already feels the nicest out of all of them. I'm interested to see if they'll add the gravity powers, maybe just for the Zero Gravity levels, or if they're just sticking with the original's framework. But I already like the change they made to the boost system. Instead of a one-off burst, you can hold the button down for a continuous boost, you'll just drain your air faster. It's a nice touch. And of course it looks very nice too, but they're making it on Unity, it's kind of expected. Again, at the time of recording, it's a very small demo with only a few characters and levels to play, but it's definitely worth your time if you have any affection for Sonic Riders, or if you wrote the game off like I did at first, but you're open to being reconvinced. There's also Sonic Riders DX, a mod for the original GameCube game. It's a fork of another popular mod, Riders Tournament Edition, which, oh wow, yikes. While DX is aimed at competitive players, it has a lot of quality of life tweaks, especially when it comes to speed. You move a lot faster when you hit dash pads, take shortcuts, or catch on a turbulence. It makes races a lot more frenetic. There are also fun little changes, like skipping all the cutscenes, adding in a fan animation, and replacing a lot of the music with themes from other Sonic games. What is this music? <laughs> the loose jank inherent to Sonic Riders is still here. I still feel like I'm barely in control and I still can't make this damn turn, but it does feel better to play. Crucially, I feel cool playing it, which the original could not do for me, and I managed to beat every race on my first try this time. So if you have the GameCube ROM, it's worth a look. This same team also overhauled Zero Gravity as Sonic Riders regravitified. Like DX, it rebalances gameplay and switches out music tracks, but it also brings back mechanics from the first Riders like boosting, attacking, the original non-explosive drift, and having powers tied to your character rather than your board, among others. You can also choose which gear to spend your rings on rather than it being almost random in the original. The gear that activated your abilities is now a stat boost. Unlike Riders X or DX, I'm less enthusiastic about this mod. I don't think the original drift suits these levels quite as well. It actively turned me around a couple times, and I'm not crazy about some of the music choices they made. Also, it crashed when I tried to play 90s Boulevard, but it's a fun mod worth checking out. I just personally feel like Zero Gravity didn't need an overhaul like the first Riders did. And the third. I will level with you all. If someone can hack Free Riders to play with an actual controller, I will go back and finish it but not a moment sooner. And the last for today, Sonic Riders Overdrive, a remaster developed by Chaos X, who's better known for helming Project 06. At the time of recording, it's not playable yet, but it does look like a smooth remaster in a similar vein to Riders DX. It remains to be seen what Chaos X will do with it, though. With all that out of the way, thank you again to my Patreon patrons. I have two bonus videos going up that are exclusive to Patreon. One is a full highlight reel of my live playthrough of Sonic Freeriders. I like this mode. Kill everyone. The second you might have been able to guess if you recognize that. Yes, this is the Sonic X DVD that came with early versions of the first game. I don't think it came in a jewel case. I bought the second hand. It, they had it separate. I'm not sure. Yeah, I don't think there was space for that. It has the four kids dubs of two episodes of the show. The first episode, Chaos Control Freaks. And for some reason, the 24th episode, How to Catch a Hedgehog. I would have thought the first and second episodes would be the way to go. Maybe they just wanted people to see more of the cast together. Either way, I have also reviewed the DVD and those two episodes. If you do support it, then along with exclusive videos, you can also see little sneak peeks that I upload while I'm working on my projects, see the full videos early, 
read the scripts, and of course get your name in the credits. I have several upcoming videos already underway. The Sonic Boom retrospective includes the show, all three games, including Rise of Lyric, and the Archie comic. Outside of Sonic and video games, I have videos planned where I rank all of the studio albums by my favorite music artists, including They Might Be Giants, Elvis Costello, Beck, and Pink Floyd, among many others with substantial discographies. If I reach a certain amount of patrons, I'll also be able to fund that video where I review a bunch of those popular YouTube sponsors like Raycon. After a point, I'll even be able to completely turn off all ads on this channel and my Let's Play channel, The Straw Hat No. All ads gone. Unless the video got content ID'd, then I may not be in control of that. Also, very unlikely I would accept most sponsorships, unless it was something I really believed in. And after that video, very unlikely anyone would want to sponsor me. So if any of that interests you, please consider supporting the Patreon. If you want to support the channel, but you'd rather do just a one-off donation, I do have a GoFundMe I set up last year to support my transition. It's still active, and there are two more stretch goals it hasn't reached, so that's also an option. But those goals go towards the Straw Hat No and our comedy channel, The Midnight Frogs, just FYI. But that's all for me today. Thank you all again. And to everyone who stuck around to the end, a little extra for you. I nearly titled part one, Sonic is Racist. Racist.